Welcome. I am really excited to be able to teach you uh, this class today. So if you're not familiar with me, my name is Samantha Beningo and I am the CEO and founder of Mind Movement, but I'm also a, a career mental health professional, a yoga instructor, and a breath coach. And I, I think if I had to kind of sum up what I actually do um, in very simple terms, I think of myself as somebody who helps other people create the life that they really want most, right? So, and whether we know it or not, that's kind of the whole point. The whole idea is that we are always creating our experience. We've just not been taught that and not been taught the mechanics of that properly. So unfortunately, we don't understand how the mind and body system works for all good reasons. Um, some of you are already very familiar with them. But um, because of that, we really don't know that you know, we're doing things all the time, very much unintentionally, that are interfering with our ability to have and experience the life that we really want, but we don't know it. And that's our greatest challenge is number one, helping us really see what those blocks are so that we can overcome them. And then number two, building something new, because as all of you are already very well aware, right? Change is not an easy thing. It's just not. And there are a lot of really um, obvious, once you know them, evolutionary principles in place be so that we don't change easily, right? So change is something that really is helping us most of the time or, or, or the fact that it's not, um, that it takes some effort to really see big changes in our lives. That's an evolutionary principle. So before we get into all of that though, um, what you're gonna need for this class, you, you go ahead and get a mat. A yoga mat is, is, you don't absolutely need it, but certainly it will be helpful. Um, a pen and a paper would be great. If you have a notebook, awesome. You don't have to have anything fancy, but definitely can help. Uh, and then something to be comfortable. So if a blanket or pillows or a bolster, that's probably all you're gonna need really for today. So um, if you don't have those and you wanna go ahead and grab them, now is a good time to do it. Um, as So I wanna begin before we get into some of the kind of practical, um, specific, the mechanics, specifics of uh, sort of what we're going to get into today that's going to help you develop your own awareness of your own blocks and the areas that you might look to create some change in to get where you want to go. We're going to first just start with a grounding exercise, and that's to try to really help you to become or experience mindfulness. And what we're really doing is we're building our muscles in exactly the same way that we would build muscles or, or, you know, the same exact way that we would go to the gym to try to see changes in our body. We're going to practice here mindfulness so that we can experience changes in our lives. So I will always ask that you show up for this um, in a very specific way practicing three things. So first and foremost, um, I ask that you stay, that you make every effort to stay the length of our time together. Now, of course, you know, you're not going to get in trouble. Nothing bad is going to happen if you don't. The reason that I ask that you stay is to practice building those muscles. Because let's, let's face it, we're in a culture right now where you know, we're constantly moving and we're constantly kind of going from one thing that's entertaining us to another thing that's entertaining us. And as soon as that gets boring, you know, we abandon it and we go on to something else. So learning how to slow down and sit through discomfort is becoming more and more challenging for people because we don't really have to do it very much in our daily lives these days. So this really is building muscles or building your tolerance and ability to change. That's really what it's all about. So the first thing I'm going to ask is that you stay. The second thing is that you give me your full attention. 
Now, that's not just because I'm narcissistic and I want everybody to pay attention to me. That's because your focused attention is the critical variable in being mindful. That's it. That's really what we're talking about. That is what mindfulness means. So what most people though don't realize, they think that they're, you know, paying attention when in actuality they're paying attention and running a dialogue at the same time. So that's what we're going to try to be really aware of here. And by running a dialogue, it may look like, um, you know, you're listening, but then you're judging my outfit or you're listening, but then, you know, you remember, oh my God, I have to go, you know, um, shopping right after this, or I have a grocery list I'm running through at the same time, or I'm judging myself. You know, I'm thinking about how there are, there, whatever the things are that I don't like about myself. So what I'm going to ask is that you try to let go of those secondary narratives and just be here with me. And I know that that can be really challenging, but that's what this is all about. Again, we're building our muscles to learn how to do this, to learn how to be present, learn how to be mindful and learn ultimately how to create big, meaningful changes in our lives to see and experience the lives we want. And then finally, I want you to listen to yourself. I want you to start to really develop your awareness muscles for your own experience. In other words, if you are having trouble focusing on what I'm saying, if you are judging me or judging you or complaining in your head about the checkout counter person, you know, at the Dwayne Reed, you just left, whatever it is, I want you to try to be aware of it and just notice it because we're not here to judge, you know, none of us are going to ever do this perfectly, no matter how much we try. So, but critical to our process of creating these lives that we want is our ability to hear our own inner dialogue. So we've got to slow down and start to really learn how to hear ourselves because there's, I'll tell you, all the answers are there. Everything you need to know to have exactly the experience you want to have in this world is there, but you can't hear it because you don't know how, right? So, or you can't hear the answers is a better way to say it. So I have you grab a pen and paper. And what I'll ask is if there's anything that you notice that you think is important, jot it down. Don't try to hold on to it the entire time that we're together because then you're going to be totally distracted. So if there's something you need to get out of your head, write it down. Um, that's part of why it's there, okay? So one other thing to remember before we get into our grounding exercise, your brain knows what it is your intentions are. And so the reason why I will repeatedly remind you of what my asks are, whether it's class number one or class number 51, is because by putting it on your radar, your brain is going to have it on your radar. And that's what we want. You know, your brain knows what it is that you, you intend. So when we don't, when we're not clear about what it is we want or what it is we're shooting for, our brain has trouble finding what it is we want, what it is we're shooting for. So we're, we want to try to start to leverage the mechanics of this mind and body system. Cause once we understand the system, we can do big things and not, they're not difficult. It's not difficult, big things, little tiny shifts that can make an enormous difference in your life. Okay. So we're going to begin with our slow breath exercise. Now we did this last week and I know that it can be kind of a little bit boring to start for some people, but the reason that we spend time on it is because it is the single most important breath for deliberate intent. In other words, this is the breath technique for change. And I'm gonna to explain to you why. So I'm gonna actually uh, pull up something so you can see it on my screen. I won't do this all the time, but I do want you to see this because it is important. So 
we're going to begin with the slow breath. So go ahead and sit up nice and tall. You can sit on your mat. You can sit on a block. You can sit on a chair as long as your feet are firmly planted into the ground. And just make sure that your sit bones are pressed firmly into the ground, into your mat. Sit up nice and tall. And so in order to find that proper spinal alignment, you're seated up nice and tall, pushing, you know, into your sit bones, into the mat. And then you want to act as though you have kind of a little string right at the center of your head, pulling you, lifting you towards the ceiling, and then just slightly tuck your chin. Now I'm looking down so that I can look at you, but you don't need to. So be aware of that, right? Um, okay. So if it's comfortable for you, I would strongly encourage you to close your eyes and you can flip your palms upside down and just rest your back of your hands onto your knees, onto your thighs. I'm sit seated in easy pose. Uh, if that's comfortable for you, that's great. If not, you can get into brick pose also, sitting up on your shins and with your bum kind of on your heels. And I know you can't see me great here, so I'll sit like this so you can kind of see. Obviously though, you don't want to be up on your tippy toes. So if that's more comfortable, feel free. Sit that way also. Again, part of why we sit like this in yoga and in meditation is to learn to tolerate discomfort. So you'll hear throughout your travels about the great yogis or the great Buddhists who, or even Buddha himself, who will sit for days and weeks and sometimes months and even years in this position without moving. And you think, how is that freaking possible, right? But learning to sit through discomfort is part of what we're learning and the skill that we're developing when we are learning and when I'm teaching mindfulness. So go ahead and sit up nice and tall, eyes are closed. And all we're gonna do is just start breathing normally, however it feels right for you. All I want you to do is seal your lips. So you're just breathing in and out through your nose. And you may have all kinds of thoughts coming into your mind. Notice them. You might even want to thank them, right? And then just allow them to pass like they're a cloud kind of stopping in to say hello and then drifting off, drifting away, trying not to grab onto your thoughts, right? Because thoughts are really interesting. They're these automated electrical kind of responses, reactions. And if we don't engage them, they'll fade, they'll, they'll fade out. So we can learn how not to engage our own mind, our own thinking. Okay. So now I want you to really try to inhale as slowly as you possibly can and to match your exhale at that same length. So obviously it's approximate. What we're trying to do though is just elongate our inhale. So seated nice and tall, eyes are closed. Inhaling through your nose as long and slowly as you can. Making sure to fill up your chest all the way down into the bottom of your belly, your low stomach, filling up your belly thinking about filling up your belly. Because for most of us, where we are gonna find that we're comfortable breathing is in our chest, which of course is the anxiety breath. So we're trying to undo that. 
so you're you can exhale normally or just practicing right um oh no exhale the same length or as close to the same length as you can on the as you did on the inhale And on your next, wherever you are on your next exhale, that very next breath, I want you to try to slow it down even more. Breathing in through the nose, exhaling out through the nose. We're going to do that one more time and again, trying to slow it down even more. Okay. Now, the thing about this breath is that we don't need to do very many of these. Why is that? Well, everything, as I mentioned last week, really everything in our experience comes down to evolution and survival. Everything. And it's really crazy when you start looking, picking your life apart, you can really see how our need for survival and our, our biologically our genetic, uh, that part of us, that automated part of us is, is everywhere. It's in everything that we're doing all the time. We just don't know it. So if you think about it, it makes perfect sense that if I was being chased by a wild animal, if I was, if my house was on fire, if I was in some type of really dangerous situation or emergency, I would not be able to slowly breathe in and then slowly exhale. So this slow, deep inhale through the nose and slow, deep exhale through the nose is sending the very clear signal to your body and then your mind that there's no threat. You're safe. Whatever was threatening is no longer threatening. Now that's critical, right? Because as some of you are already very aware, most of the time, what's creating anxiety or fear or what's activating the fear response in us now, circa 2020, is not any real danger to our lives in this moment, but is our thoughts, is our fear-based thinking, thinking about something that hasn't happened yet and worrying about what's going to happen. So that unpredictability is really what creates fear. So it's our thinking that's creating our anxiety. Now, no matter how anxious I might be, if I can calmly breathe in through my nose, slowing down my breathing, slowing down the exhale, I, no matter what I'm, I'm, I'm anxious about, I'm sending the message that the threat has been removed. And so it's a hack. It's a life hack. And you'll notice that if you can remember, even just set a timer on your phone to do the slow breath exercise three or four times a day, no matter where you are, even just three or four times a day, three or four times, what you'll notice is you're operating at a much less anxious pace. You feel far more grounded, far more present, and your mind is not as active. So you're not, you know, that the pace, the constant thoughts, 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 thoughts right, has really slowed down. So this is a critical technique that we give to everybody early on in their process because it's so effective. So if you can't remember to do anything else when you're anxious or when you're starting to feel yourself escalate or feeling overwhelmed, you know, may not be anxiety that you're struggling with. It just might be that 
you're moving really quickly and you feel really overwhelmed and you don't know why, right? It might be just stress. Again, slow breath three or four times a day, three or four times each time is going to make a big, big difference. So it's also going to help you to start to understand how this mind and body system works and works effectively when we understand how it works. So the other thing that I wrote here, you'll see on the slide is do your best. Now, whenever we're doing an exercise, that's all we can do. There's going to be days where our mind gets away from us, where we are just anxious, where we can't, you know, force ourselves to sit down and do mindfulness or, or take a yoga class or whatever it is. And we've got to be easy about that. Right. So, you know, it's not helpful if we're beating the crap out of ourselves that we're not good enough. And that unfortunately is probably the single most devastating belief in most of our lives already. So many of us are operating from a, we're not good enough place. And that, as I said, once you start to understand how this mind and body system works, you'll see why the idea or the thought or the constant operating from that place of I'm not good enough, you'll see why that's so devastating to our lives. Now, as we go through this next segment, again, I want to remind you, watch your mind. Notice where you're at and really trying to approach whatever comes up in that spirit of curiosity, not in a heavy way, not in a, oh my God, I'm not, I'm never going to get this. You know, we are inherently critical and our culture has created a very negative mentality universally, right? The average person is uh, negative 80% of the time. In other words, right? Critical, angry, cranky, complaining. So be easy about this, right? See if you can't approach it with a spirit of curiosity and like, huh, wow, that's interesting, rather than snap judgments or criticism. Okay, so we're going to get out of the sharing mode. Thanks for that. Okay, so and what I want to encourage you to do throughout the rest of our time together today is to practice the slow breath and the inhale through the nose and the exhale through the nose. A critical shift. So, right, in yoga, that is the yogi breath, is to inhale through the nose and to exhale through the nose. And this is a game-changing breath for managing the nervous system. That is why we use it, right? It's called the ujjayi breath in yoga, and it helps us to kind of remember to stay focused on the here and now. But it does many other things also that we'll get into another time. So certainly practice today, right now, while we're together uh, to get that going, to start to make that a habit, right? That's what this is all about, habituation. Doing something on purpose enough times that your body just says, oh, this is how we're going to do it from now on. Okay, so when we talk about mindfulness, right, most of us think that that word means something like awareness. But what it actually refers to is paying attention, right? As I said, focused attention. So in a particular way, on purpose and non-judgmentally. So that's what mindfulness means. It just means we're being deliberate and we are practicing really listening, hearing how we are thinking so that we can be even more deliberate in creating our lives. When I say our lives, I mean all of it. So if you're not sure whether or not this applies to you, if you're not sure what I'm even talking about, if you're not sure what I mean by creating your life, if you think I'm still talking in metaphors, great. Think about your life. Think about every aspect of it, you know, relationships, financial health. Think about your, your health. 
uh, the state of your body. You know, do you look and feel the way that you would like to right now? Um, your career, your level of success, whatever that means to you, uh, your family, all the things that matter to you. Look around and just sort of quickly take a little survey of your life. If you want to know whether or not mindfulness can be an effective change modality for you or how we might use it, just sort of ask yourself, is there some area of my life that I could use some improvement in? Or is there an area where I feel like I'm not, I'm not satisfied, where I don't have what I want? whether it's a relationship with our, with our kids, our partners, whether it's, you know, I'm still single at whatever age and I would like to be in a relationship, whether it's the amount of money you have in your bank or don't have in the bank, I guess. Um, you know, if it's a career, just feeling like I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, certainly, right, COVID has kind of forced us all into these very unique situations. And so there's a lot of self-evaluating going on. And that's certainly what I'm seeing from my clients, but just from even colleagues, just everywhere, people kind of taking a step back and going, huh, do I even like my life, right? So if there's an area where you're looking and you're saying, you know, I'm not satisfied here. Like I want more money or, you know, but, but Sam, it seems like nothing I do matters. Like I, I just can't seem to get out of my own way or I just can't seem to get what I want. That's what we would use mindfulness for. Because what's happening when we look at our lives and there's an area of dissatisfaction, what's happened there is twofold. We don't know it. On one hand, what we're doing is we are interacting with our lives in such a way as to unintentionally block that thing, those things from being a part of our experience. Now, again, because we misunderstood and never were taught properly how this mind and body system work, we don't understand that. It sounds like I'm you know, speaking crazy talk. But the truth is, and we're gonna talk about this in a moment, your thoughts and emotions are physical. So every thought you have is a physical chemical reaction in the brain and in the body that is affecting the brain and body. And as is the other way around. So every time I move a muscle, every time I take a substance, I, you know, shot of tequila and I put it in my body, that then also affects my mind, my thoughts, my thoughts and emotions. But we've not been taught that. So what does this have to do with, you know, me having the job I want? Well, actually everything, absolutely everything. And that's exactly what mindfulness is all about. And that's exactly what it is. If you stick around, stay with me a little while, you'll be an expert at you will understand soup to nuts, what it is that you're doing that's interfering with your ability to have the things you want and how to begin to take steps forward in the here and now, which is the second part of what we do, to change it so that you can start to see those things play out the way you would like. Now, the other thing I want to just remind you is that we all have areas of our lives that we are good at. You know, maybe we don't want to admit it, Maybe we're not the best that ever lived, but we're all good at something. And so, you know, you want to just remind yourself to take a look at that area and say, hey, you know what? I set out to do that thing here and I did it. So I know that I can. It's just that I have these blocks that I don't even know I have around these other areas or these topics or these subjects. And that's what happens. The brain wires in a certain way, we call it coupling, as to make certain subjects or, or, or achieving certain things in our lives harder than others. And again, I'm being very general because this is such a huge topic, but I promise it'll all be very clear to you sooner rather than later. So 
what we're doing here, we're paying attention to what's going on in our minds and learning how to start to see our blocks and then begin to take those active measures and steps to create the change we want to see. Now, when I say that, I've used this philosophical framework uh, for mental health for 18 years. I mean, you know, it wasn't quite as polished then, but the same kind of general idea, right, um, has helped people overcome anxiety disorders, depression, substance use disorders, um, even psychoses. So certainly this is, you know, big stuff that we're talking about. In other words, how we feel and how we think can be transformed with these ideas. However, we can also see big changes to our pocketbooks or our material gains or the job, our career success. And that's all because of the subtleties of our sensory perception that we don't know are there. Again, because of bad information. So awareness, knowing what it is that we're doing that's interfering with our ability to get what we want is the key to change. I call that seeing our blind spots. The challenge we face with seeing our blind spots is they are blind. We can't see them, right? Otherwise we would change them. We would know they were there. So that's where it's really, you run into all kinds of walls trying to do this on your own and why self-help can often be challenging because we can't see what we don't know is there. So part of our work is really me helping you to learn how to develop your own awareness so that you can start to see what you don't know is there that's negatively affecting your ability to get where you want to go. Because it is, whether you know it or not. It, it always is. Um, okay. I want to explain to you what, what we mean by change, right? Because, you know, here, let me, I'm going to, I'll share this with you, uh, which is great. I'm so excited that I get to share this with you because usually we're on mind body and that is not working and I'd much rather be on Zoom. So this is awesome for me. Um, so what does it even mean to change? You know, we use that phrase all the time. Like we really do. But the truth is, as many of you already know from your own personal experiences, just think about how hard it is to lose five pounds. Seriously, think about, you know, or, or gain five pounds, depending on which side of the situation you're on, right? So I think back to my weight struggles, years of what I didn't even know was, a, was really an eating disorder, mild eating disorder for half my life. Now I look back and I, I mean, I remember the daily struggle. My relationship with food was so painful. It was so difficult. It was like just constantly looking in the mirror and being critical and hating myself and never seeing results, you know, like walking or running on the treadmill for like a thousand years and not seeing what I wanted to see. And so that's really important, right? Change is difficult. It's not easy. And when we talk about it, what are we even saying? So our definition or the definition I like to use a mind movement, what do I do? What am I doing? If you come to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, what I will tell you is we're creating new neural pathways that hold up over time and under stress. So that's key. So if you ever took exams, now I will use uh, examples from college because I spent 4,000 years there still probably not over yet <laughs> so i like to you know uh, at least get something out of that time um and, and use those metaphors so right i think back to studying for tests you know how many times did i study for a test and retain long term like two maybe two percent like two percent on a good day right so in other words i would learn it enough to be able to take the test and do pretty well on the exam. 
But then the second that I woke up the next day, you know, I was able to say, okay, brain, I don't need this anymore. You know, forget it. You don't need to waste any more energy on this information. Now, that's exactly what happens with change. But now think about when you learn to ride a bike or when you learned to, you know, uh, the land, the layout of your, your home or your apartment or your office. When we're doing something over and 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 over again, at a certain point, that becomes automatic. We do not have to put any effort into doing that thing anymore because we know how to do it. Now, riding a bike is an incredibly complex set series of complex interactions, the level of the body and the mind that are funky and hard to figure out at first, as you know, because riding a bike is like, you know, it's challenging. The same thing um, with snowboarding. You know, it's like the learning curve in the beginning is intense. You're on your edges, you're falling down all the time, right? You spend like weeks on your ass pretty much. Same thing. But then once you know how to do it, you can't erase that. You, you can't go back to, I don't know how to do it. You just get on a bike and you know how to ride it. Get on a snowboard and you know how to ride it, right? Like you might be a little, might not be great at it, like at the same level as you were competitively at one point, right? It might take me a little while to get used to it again, but I know how to do it. There's a map for that, a series or sequence of neural pathways, a map that is hardwired into my circuitry now, to my mind, to my brain and my body. So my brain and body know exactly how to jump back into that no matter what, over time and in a state of distress. Right? So if I was being chased, I could jump on a bike and I would know how to ride it. Now, the reason that that's important is because when we get afraid, when the body is afraid, when we get afraid, <gasps> you know, <gasps> when I start thinking about, oh my God, I don't have enough money, or what if this happens, or what if that happens, or whatever your thing is, what if that person leaves me, or what if that person is lying, or whatever the, our thing is, what happens when COVID is over? What happens is I, re, I re, resort or revert back to my old patterns, the patterns that were probably there from childhood that were defensive or designed to protect me and keep me safe, and oftentimes childish, right? Like running away and hiding under a desk instead of, you know, like, I don't know, manning up to use some kind of terrible phrase, right? And going and facing whatever it is that you're, you know, worried about, challenged by, upset, you know, upset about, whatever it is. So in other words, when we're afraid, we are not in our adult mind. We are in autopilot mode. And as a result of that, we resort to the old stuff because it's, cons it's taking up less energy. It's automatic. It's just what happens. It's, it's an automatic response. Now, in order to create a much more proactive, much healthier, much more adaptive, in other words, a reaction that doesn't hurt us, but that is in our best interest, right? The reaction that is our grown up automatic self under distress. We've got to work pretty hard for a significant period of time to hardwire into the system that response. Because most people under stress go backwards. And, you know, I hate using these phrases backwards for us. You know, you know what I mean, helpful and not helpful. That's really it. Like there's no good and bad here. It's just helpful, you know, getting me closer to my goals or further from my goals. So that's what change is. Change is creating a new habit or pattern in the body and brain and mind that holds up over time and under stress. But we're not built to change easily. Well, why not? Well, think about it. There's some really obvious answers, right? If you were, if we were in person right now, I'd be asking you to think about this and give me the answer. Like, why might we be built from a survival perspective to not change easily? Well, if you think about it, right, it's really logical. It makes tons of sense. Sorry, we gotta go back. And that is, 
it, 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 we use an incredible amount of energy when we're learning something new, right? So to learn something new, think about what a baby, a child, think about how much they have to learn. Like a baby doesn't know how to do anything. It can't crawl. It can't walk, right? It can't do anything. It has to learn how to do everything from scratch. And then we teach it like we are there to guide this new life in the direction of learning how to, how to walk, how to talk, how to eat, right? How to do, how, how to do everything, how to interact with other human beings, all of it. But then once they learn, it's just automatic, right? So when we think about change, imagine if, if it was easy to change, then think about how easy it would be to forget how to walk, to forget how to talk, to forget how to eat. So all of these things that wire in, that become so entrenched in our very being and every aspect of who we are, these learned behaviors, really, and these learned patterns, not just behaviors, but right, they're all, they're, they're hardwired in so we do not forget them. And in order to create that level of, um, you know, commitment, in other words, you have to somehow prove to your mind and body that this thing is important to you because you're about to use a lot of energy to create a new habit or pattern. That's why it takes so much motivation, so much effort to lose five pounds, right? We've got to really be committed. You've got to get up and, you know, eat every day the way that you're supposed to eat. You've got to make sure that you're working out religiously and you can't give up. You've got to stay the course. Otherwise, you're not going to see the result, which we all know because we've all experienced it. And if you haven't, certainly you know somebody in your life who's constantly up and down with their weight or who struggled to lose 10 pounds their whole life, right? So we see how this plays out. Now, why am I talking about this? Why does this even matter? It matters because there are so many patterns, habits that we have that we don't know we have that are negatively, as in negatively not helping us achieve or create the lives we want. So I'm going to give you some really easy examples of this. Let's say that I'm, you know, 41 years old, 42 years old, and I don't have a, I've never been married. I've never had a long-term relationship. You know, I, I want that. I would really like to have that, but I obviously, I feel like the, the clock is, is ticking. I still would like a family, but I don't, there's no promise on the horizon of that. And I've never had that. So without knowing anything about that person, nothing, I don't have to know, you know, gender, um, ethnicity, sexual orientation, job history. I don't have to know anything else about them to know that they have what we would say uh, tapes, right? They have an autopilot mode that is running patterns that's working against their ability to have what they want. There is a whole system of wired thoughts and emotions that are working against that person having what they want. How do I know? Because they don't have it. Because they're saying they want this thing. And as long as I believe that's true, as long as I believe that that person is really truly wants what they say that they want, there's got to be a reason why it's not here. Now, I know that I'm sure that sentence, what I just said, is, uh, you know, is controversial because we've all, again, been taught very specific rules and ideas about the way things really are. Tragically, however, we've been given a lot of crappy information that doesn't serve us. And therefore, um, we don't know how perception works. We really don't know that thoughts and emotions are physical. And we really don't know how fear works in the body. We really don't know that perception selects our experience as we go along. Now, 
we really don't understand any of that because no one's ever taught, right? No one's ever taught you. And, and, and in fact, even as a, a healthcare professional, I was not taught that this came, I mean, well, I had to go seek out the information to find it. It wasn't just like common information handed out all over the place, stuff that I had to go seek and, you know, bang down doors to learn. And that's the tragedy. So here's an example. Here's an, a pretty daunting number. And then we're going to go into an exercise. 98% of our thoughts from day to day are the same as the day before. So when you woke up today, 98% of the thoughts that you had today are the same as yesterday. 98%. Now on average, we have anywhere between like 60 and 80,000 thoughts a day, you know, give or take, or you can argue on either end. Um, but that's a lot of thoughts. That's an incredible amount of thinking that happens every single day. 80% of those thoughts or an estimated 80% in the average person, not the average depressed person, but the average person off the street are negative, are critical, are angry, are complaining, are sad, are judgmental. So you can start to see if I spend 80% of my thought life, 80% of the time, eight out of 10 thoughts, are negative in nature and 98% of them are the same as yesterday, right? I don't know it, but by accident, through my thoughts, emotions, focus, and by nature of the mechanics of this mind and body system, I am selecting every day negative thoughts, sad, you know, angry thoughts, um, negative meaning, right? Unpleasant on the mood spectrum, which you will learn about and I will show you, that then create negative emotions or negative thoughts that create negative emotion. And now that becomes a habit because we keep doing it. And if you keep doing that every day for any kind of length of time, you know, even if you had a good reason, even if you experienced a loss, even if you experienced a breakup and it made sense to you to wake up every day and feel sad. After a certain amount of time, that's going to just be how you wake up because your body says, Hey, you keep wasting all this energy here on this topic and I'm feeling sad. So I better automate that so that we can stop wasting energy. We can conserve the energy that you're putting into constantly thinking about this. So you see what I mean now, if I'm always focused negatively, feeling negative, feeling sad, feeling angry, thinking angry, thinking sad, thinking angry, what happens is my perception, right? All of my senses, my sense of uh, sight, right? My, my auditory senses, my senses start selecting what bits of information to pay attention to because we can only take in so much information from our sensory environment at any given moment. And so what happens, what happens is we select information accidentally that is aligned with or the same as how we're thinking and feeling in every moment. So if I'm feeling sad and I'm feeling cranky and I go, onto the New York City subway system, guess what's likely to happen? I'm likely to see more reasons to feel sad and angry on the subway. And if I'm conversely feeling really happy and really excited, I'm a lot more likely to notice, perceive that experience in a far more hopeful and positive light. And in the most basic sense, I just laid out for you one of many reasons or ways in which we are unknowingly creating our experience. So if I am far more aware of what I don't like or what I don't want than what I do, the moment that I step outside my home, the moment that I interact even on the computer with my world, social media, what's going to happen is all of those negative 
you know, judgmental thoughts, all of that negative focus is going to be reflected back to me in everything that I engage with. And then I, it, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. See, I told you that this world sucks. <laughs> See, I told you how shitty everything is. See, look. And so it just gives us more reason to feel entitled to our negative thoughts and emotions. Now, this is how this pattern plays out. And again, one of many, and we'll cover as many of them as we can in our time together. So that's enough of that. I want to, before we leave, as I know we're short on time, I want to just go ahead and do our final uh, exercise for tonight. So for this, you can go ahead and get comfortable. So if you want to lay down, um, if you're comfortable, more comfortable seated, that's fine. But the key here is to be as comfortable as possible. If you want to use um, a bolster or pillows under your uh, under you know the backs of your knees, lying down underneath your back, wherever you know, be comfortable. That is going to be the most important uh, component for this. Now, after this, we're not going to have a chance to process this exercise, so we'll finish while you're in this relaxed position. And ideally, what would be best is to have you get up after and do some writing. So you have your notebook hopefully handy. Just free write any thoughts that came to mind, what your overall experience was like, how you feel in your body. Again, we're just we're sharpening our muscles for awareness and being able to learn how to be mindful. Because, you know, I can't tell you how many people say to me, you know, I can't do mindfulness. I've tried or, you know, I tried meditation and I can't do that. And the truth is, of course you can't. Nobody can. We have to, we have to practice just like with anything else, right? So we're not going to be good at this. You know, I'm not good at this and I've been doing it for 13 years. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really something that you have to um, give a shot, give a chance. But, but it will work. And I can tell you from my own personal experiences, you can have extraordinary, experience extraordinary things with mindfulness alone. Okay, so get comfortable. And when you are, we're going to have you go ahead and close your eyes. And once again, seal your lips and start to breathe through your nose. Taking a couple of nice, deep, slow, long inhales and slowing down your exhale even more than before. And just keep that nice flow to your breathing. If you like counting, I would recommend counting either to five, inhale for one, two, three, four, five, exhale for six, six, five, four, three, two, one. Inhale for five, one, two, three, four, five. Exhale for six, six, five, four, three, two, one. Continue with that breath count for a couple of minutes. Maybe not a couple of minutes, maybe a couple of seconds in actuality. And see how that pace, see how that pace feels for you. Using counting can be an incredibly helpful starting point into the world of mindfulness because 
we have to focus. So when I add more sensory kind of, you know, the more senses I have to use when doing something, the easier it's going to be for me to pay attention or the harder it's going to be for me to drift off. So adding a count to your breathing is a really easy way to get your head back in the game, bring it back into the moment. So just continue with that breath count. Inhaling for five, exhaling for six, just doing the best that you can. And as we end for the evening, I want to leave you with this. Awareness is the first part of the process of change and of the process of learning mindfulness, but integrity is the second. And by integrity, that means learning how to be honest with myself, not judging myself against some moral standard that somebody else set, but learning to be honest with me. Now, one area where I know I was terrible at this was starting out with mindfulness and meditation years and years ago. When I was 19 years old, someone taught me mindfulness, Buddhism, and meditation, and I got it. I understood right away what this was all about. But what I couldn't do was be present. And it would take me another lifetime before I could do it. Because I never practiced, I never tried. I would pretend that I was trying and I'd be lying there with everybody else in the class pretending to, you know, do whatever exercise my teacher had just given us. But I never did. I just sat in my head, you know, made stuff up, went someplace wherever I wanted to go. And what I would employ you to consider is giving the exercises a real chance, giving them your all. Because if you don't put any effort in, you're not going to get anything out of it. And this is powerful stuff. There's a reason why so many people are talking about these, these things, right? Mindfulness, meditation, yoga, because they work, but they only work if you do it or give it your all, right? Just give it your all because we're never going to get it perfect. Okay, so if you feel up to it, stay where you are for another five minutes. Continue the counting or play with the different inhale and exhale count. And when you are finished, take just a minute to jot down what is in your head, how you're feeling, how mindful on a scale of zero to five, zero, not at all, five, the Zen master, how mindful were you today and are you right now? Okay, you guys, thank you so, so much for your time and attention, um, for your effort, and hopefully I will see you back here again next Thursday night, 5 o'clock. Be well, everybody. Stay safe.